So I'm very happy to be here. Um, I guess part of, is my mic on? I'm just kidding, too soon, too soon. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, part of, I guess, claiming your story is claiming your story when you hear someone else tell it. So thank you for Yvonne for the beautiful introduction. Um, and, uh, and actually I wanna, um, so even in the last two days, I've sort of changed what I want this experience to be about. So I'm, I, I've got like a lot of notes and a lot of things I want to talk about and a lot of things I want to do and a lot of things I want us to do together. And I'm, I'm going to wing it a little bit. So go with me. Um, but before I start, I do want us to know, I want to know and I want us to know who else is in the room. Um, but I don't want us to like go around and like tell us our jobs and things like that. Um, so. Um, because I feel like we do quite a lot of that. Um, uh, so actually what I'd like you to do is, um, uh, let's just go around briefly and say our, our just, just say three things, just so we get a sense of who's in the room. Um, just your name, um, the, the place that you were born, which may or may not be the place that you call home, but we were all born in one place, so let's stick with that, I think, right? Is there, is there something politically? Yeah. No, I think we're all born in a place, right? Okay. Not like on dodgy ground yet. OK. Uh, so our name, the place where we were born, and, um, and how about this? Um, the, tell, tell us just the last time that you were on stage. Um, that could be never, if you have never been on stage. It could have been mere hours ago. Uh, it could be, and however you interpret that, it could be, you know, in a synagogue setting, it could be in a school play, it could be uh, accepting an award. Just tell us very quickly the last time that you were on a stage. Um, Acting or on stage? Just on a, you could be like rolling across it. You could be like chasing a ball. <laughs> just like physically on a stage, okay? Uh, so I'm David. Um, I was born in Chicago. Woo! Uh, and the last, I guess, well, this might, does this count? So I'm on a stage right now, right? So I'm in front of you speaking. So I'll, I'll use this very moment as the last time and the next time, I guess, the ongoing time that I'm on stage. Can I turn to you? And you could say never, if it, you've never been on stage. Okay. Um, my name is Rebecca. I was born in Philadelphia, and the last time I was on stage was actually on set when I worked at the Colbert Report. I was briefly cast as a Jewish friend of students. <laughs> Great. Sweden. 
I was last on stage on Friday honey by my students and exams. My name is Jordan. I was born in Englewood, New Jersey in the United States. Yes. Yeah. Jersey County. <laughs> <laughs> Jersey girls. And the last time I was on stage was at a synagogue delivering a speech for the Sisterhood Shabbat. Uh, my name is Shikma. I was born in uh, Carmel Hospital in Haifa. And last time I was on stage was uh, Wednesday in front of my students as well, uh, giving them the last uh, class of the semester. Hi, my name is Rotem. Um, I was born here in Israel. And last time I was on stage was yesterday in the UPG. Hi, I'm Ariane. I was born in Merrimack, New Hampshire. And last time I was on stage was also in New Hampshire. Hi, I'm Sarah. I was born in New York City, and the last time I was on stage was uh, in February DJing at, in Jamaica at a Studio 54 themed party where they had little cocaine baggies on the table. <laughs> 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 okay. Hi, I'm Ruth. Um, I was born in Miami Beach, and I was on stage um, last night. I didn't see you. Where? <laughs> My name is Miriam. I was born in upstate New York in Albany. Um, and the last time I was on stage was um, two weeks ago at the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts. But I was in front of the stage uh, performing an American Sign Language interpretation of the show. Oh, cool. Showboat. Oh, wow, cool. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Please. Uh, my name is Rebecca. I was born in Brussels in Poland. The last time I was on stage, uh, it was yesterday in the Fijian session. Right. Is that everybody? Please. Um, sorry for saying the best. Uh, I'm Igor from uh, Stuttgart, Israel. Last time I was on stage was a few months ago in Portland, Maine, uh, in a concert of 20 artists from 20 different countries trying to do mind reading with the audience, which <laughs> failed. <laughs> <laughs> then I found myself improving stand-up comedy to the, talking about my Israel, Jewish Israeli experience. Great. <laughs> Is that everybody? Okay. Great. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So one of the things that like I took from listening to that is that um, even though not all of us, or probably very few of us, consider ourselves performers or actors or, or, or you know, theater artists or however you define it. Most of us, or almost all of us, have opportunities to be on stage, right? Whether it's in a private setting or a public setting, whether it's in a professional setting or an entertainment setting, we all have uh, opportunities in our life, partly because by virtue of the fact that we're the kind of people that would come to a kind of thing like this, where we're like in front of people talking. We're presenting something, we're explaining something, we're introducing someone else. We have a, mo we have a moment in our life that there's focus on us. Um, so with that comes a, an opportunity. And, and it's an opportunity that I think that um, we don't take enough advantage of, uh, or many of us don't take enough advantage of. And that's an opportunity to tell a story, to tell a story about yourself, okay? We, even in the last couple of days of ROI, we've seen, let's just talk about the two of the outside speakers that we've had. We had 
Nancy uh, on the first night, and then we had Shia this morning. Shia. Shia, sorry, Shia. 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 Uh, thank you. So Shia this morning. Um, both of them told uh, um, stories about the work that they were doing, but both of them also told stories about themselves. And I propose that th it's the story about yourself that really helps your audience, whoever your audience is, connect to the work you're doing, right? It, it's a, it's a, I, I think they're both necessary, but I think too often we think, oh, I'm gonna talk about the people that I work with, I'm gonna talk about the project, I'm gonna talk about the country I'm from, and we forget to talk about ourselves and our own investment in, in, in what that work is, right? So in this workshop, I wanna talk a little bit about why those stories are important, how you can find those stories, how you can become really good at telling those stories, and how you can also connect whatever that story is to whatever it is you're trying to do, whether it's running a staff meeting or performing a play, whatever, whatever the sort of public engagement level is. That's a lot to cover in not a lot of time, so I'll sort of you know, do my best and, and maybe skip around a little if I, if I have to, too. Um, also, let me ask a quick question. How many of you have with you right now some way of searching through your email? Awesome. Okay, that's great. If you don't, it's okay. Like, meaning like, you know, a smartphone or a laptop or something like that. Okay, great. That's a, kind of incredible. Uh, so, one of the things that, in, that drives me in my work, um, and, and so, Telling your story, the second part of that is with found text. Does, has anybody in this room heard of found text? No. Or familiar with it at all? So maybe let me just, before we jump into it, a, a quick exercise, let me just say a little bit about what found text is with the caveat that I really don't know what it is and I'm <laughs> making up a definition. Okay. So found text, let's say, for the purposes of today, um, is text that you have found. Uh, right. um, meaning that it's text that was not necessarily intended to be uh, um, used in the way you're going to use it. Recycled text, okay? For example, this pen has text on it that says ROI community. If I, right? That's not very. That's not very original, right? So if I were to use that those words ROI community and tell you and tell you a story about the ROI community based on the text on whatever I found on this pen I would be recycling this text right um, if what there what's behind you is that a map of the, the emergency instructions great so if I said I'm going to tell you a story based on whatever is on that sign there and I went over to it and I found that it had emergency instructions, I would be recycling whatever that text was for my own purposes, right? So I might use that text to tell you a story about another time that I was in an emergency instructions meeting situation. Um, or another time that I had to use a map to get somewhere, right? So part of, what I'm, part of what I'm interested in is all the opportunities that we have to find text around us. Things in your email, things in your backpack, things in your wallet, things in your Facebook status, things in your um, uh, credit card history, things in your browser history. We have all of these digital kinds of found text. Why is that interesting? Well, because back in olden times, I don't know when those were, like 100 years ago, let's say, in olden times, you would write letters. And you would write hand, hard, co hard copy letters that you would send in the mail, and people would keep those letters. So if Jordan and I both lived 100 years ago in olden times, and much later, someone wanted to write a story about our friendship. They might be able to actually find those letters, and they would be like long, detailed letters in cursive with lots of details and dates and times, and they would be able to piece together, if they could find that, those letters, the story of our friendship, right? I feel that today, we don't, we don't, we're not making that resource in the same way. We're not writing things down in the same way. We're not keeping things in the same way. So like Jordan and I, let's say, like 100 years from now, if someone was trying to piece together, if we knew each other, how would they figure that out? They would go find the archived ROI 2013 website, and they would see that we were both there. They might like be able to find some emails that we 
sent to each other, maybe. They probably wouldn't be able to find text messages that we sent to each other. They wouldn't be able to find, and obviously the live interaction, there's no necessarily record. Oh, well, it's being videotaped right now. So this, this document will live on, I hope. So I'm interested in the way that we today, 2013, are making a different record of our lives than we did 100 years ago. Um, uh, when I set out to write something, to write a, a play or to write a, 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 a blog or something else that I write, I can use my digital archive as resource material. I don't have letters really from when I was a kid growing up. I don't have the letters that I wrote to people and I don't have the letters that they wrote to me. I have like a couple of like bar mitzvah cards in a box somewhere, but it's not like a real rich source of information about myself. So it's changing the way that I, I look for information about myself. Okay. So that's, that's a little bit about what found text is, as I'm understanding it. Recycled text, text that you're using from your past for some other purpose. There are lots of other definitions out there, but that's the one that I'm going to stick with today. OK. Um, so in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to uh, turn to someone. So, so who doesn't have access to their email in some way right now? Because I can give you anybody else? doesn't have access to searching their email. That's great. I can give you an alternate assignment, Helen. Hippie Helen, without access to her email. Where are you from? <laughs> right. Right. Yes. OK, great. <laughs> Sarah also has access to Helen's email. We don't know why. <laughs> OK. So I'm going to ask you just to um, turn to the person next to you in just a moment. And I'm going to give you a word, OK? And I want you to search through your email for that word, right? So you might have to open up your search function. Work email? <laughs> Good question. Work email or personal email or your like secret porn email? Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Strike that from the record. Uh, let's, wh whichever you prefer, whichever you prefer. Uh, um, uh, does everybody have their search bar open or whatever? No. Okay. So, yeah, right. It, it could be your inbox, it could be your archive. It, this, is, this is not the important part of the exercise. However, you want to search through your email is fine. Okay. <laughs> so search for the word, uh, I was going to do a, a sad word, but I think I should do a happy word. Um, search for the word hug, H-U-G, and you can search in, your, in whatever language, in your language, does every language have a word for hug? Does the word yeah. hug exist in all of them? Okay. okay. Fair enough. See what happens. Yeah, see what happens. When you turn it off. Right, so that's, that's, that's what's happening for you. Yes. Are we searching for emails in the ascent? We're looking for the last one. Great. All right, so, so uh, put, put a fork in it, just a moment. Great. So what you're already learning what you're already learning is that like your email inbox is actually like a place of great chaos and confusion, right? Because you have spam, you have email signatures that might say hug. It's it's actually fairly hard to get get what you're after right away. So what I'm what what you're supposed to be looking for, what I'd like you to look for, is an email that you have either you have sent or that someone has sent you that has the word hug in it. Not something from Amazon, not something from spam. If you can't find one, try the word kiss. Kiss. Okay. Once you have found once you found an email that either you sent or that someone sent you that has the word either hug or kiss, turn to the person next to you. So you two and then you two and then you two. And I'd like you to share with that person, if you feel comfortable, and you don't, if you don't feel comfortable, share with that person just the first sentence of that email. Okay?
were from? Yeah. Were they ex at the time that they were sending yes. you off? Okay. Yeah. Very platonic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, great. So, so, even from giving everybody one word, or maybe one or two words, you see it generates a lot of different kinds of answers, a lot of different kinds of responses, and also it, 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 it generates things that you didn't necessarily know were in your inbox. You might not have realized how often you write the word hug or someone writes the word hug to you, or that there's one friend that always says hug, or that maybe you don't say it often at all, but you think it, you might have thought you would have. So just by using that one uh, uh, exercise, you, uh, you can start to see that there's a lot more material in there than, than maybe we realize, right? It's one of the, um, you know, it's one of the positive spins on like having a really crappy system of organizing your email is that it's like all there somewhere. And if you use Gmail, it makes it very easy to search sort of through everything, and I'm sure other email programs do as well. You know, we like there's a lot of talk about the problems of internet privacy, um, but this is a way of using our lack of internet privacy to our advantage, right? So we can own all of that detritus that we've collected in our lives. So now let's take this in a slightly different direction, okay? So think for a moment about um, work that you do or something that you care about. Just think for a, mo a moment about it. It doesn't have to be your main job. It doesn't have to be the reason you are here at ROI. Just think for a minute about something that you care about in the world, right? And try and boil it down to a word, right? So if what I care about is, um, you know, we all care about lots and lots of things. So I might think about all the different things I care about, and the word I'm gonna focus on for just now is, let's just say, um, story, right? So search in your inbox for that word. And if that word is hug, choose a different word. <laughs> search in your inbox for the word that you have in your mind, just one word. And now what I'd actually like you to do is go all the way back to the very first email that you can access that has that word in it. Might take a while. So keep hitting, you know, back or more or back or more until you get to the very first word that you can, the, the very first email that you can find, either an email that you sent or an email that you received. Even if it's work related? Even if it's work related, whether or not it's work related. Again, like there, this, this is not a, perfect system. Some of you may have only had this email address for two months, so you're only going to have two months of record. Some of you may have had this email address for a long time. Try and find something that is, let's say, if you can't go all the way to the first one, try to find something that's at least a year or two old, if possible. Has anybody found either the oldest email or an email from about a year ago or at least more that they'd like to share? Okay, great. So. You can keep searching if you're still searching, but I'm going to ask, sorry, tell me your name again. Raywell. Raywell. I'm going to ask Raywell just to tell us about the email. You don't have to read the whole thing. Yeah. Maybe read a line or two. Just tell us about it. Uh, I wrote literature, uh -huh. and I found um, an email that I sent to my, my sister when I've been to India. So I've been like in this remote, like the, one of the most, like the highest villages in the world in northern India. And, she, and I sent her to meet with all the people in the universities to write me down to literature and all kind of stuff. And she was totally confused because I was there, she was just like roaming the university. And we were explaining to one another what we should do, like what she was. Cool. Yeah. And how long ago was that email? Uh, that's 2008, August. Great. Anybody else want to share something? Yeah. I'm like a samurai freak, so I searched for honor. Uh -huh. and. Um, it's really touching. I found this email I got when I was a teenager from my favorite author, mm -hmm. and that was like a turning point for me and mm -hmm. when I wanted to actually try to be a writer. Awesome. Great. That's it. That's the workshop. Thank you all. <laughs> uh, anybody else want to share some? follow-up emails to that. Great. <laughs> I, <laughs> totally not. Um, I, uh, I looked up the word goat because it's my favorite animal, and I oh, got so many good. emails about goats. And I went back. I thought that'd be fun. Yeah, I care about them. And I went back to, um, as far as I could go, so I got a forward from my mother already. 
uh, October 27, 2011, and it's a word, please Dr. Evans, it says, colonoscopy journal, dash, please enjoy <laughs> my information. <laughs> I'm like, all right, funny to me, I'm so sorry. Anyway, <laughs> How does it relate to where is joke in that? So I search, <laughs> and it, it's disgusting, and I'm sorry now that I need to <laughs> 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 No, it does. How dare you? Uh, it's no. It's like they had to take some kind of thing to help move things along, and he said it tasted like goat spit. I told you that it's uncomfortable. No, it's and I great. It. And I, even I knew what I was going to say, but it just it just made me laugh. Yeah, yeah it's awesome. That's awesome. Anybody else? Yes, please. I'll share. Um, I typed in the word uh, helping because maybe just said something that you're passionate. Yeah. So um, I went back. So I used to be a performer, and this email is from a show that I did, and I was trying to, there's an organization, uh, Equity Fights AIDS, and they do a, like a seasonal CD called Carols for a Cure, and all the Broadway shows produce an original song, and they do a cover of a show tune, like a, you know, poly theme tune. And I wrote an email to the producer of our show, uh, Phil Collins, who composed the music for the show, and I was asking the producer to ask Phil, if you compose a song for us to record on the album. And at the end, I just wrote, thanks so much for helping and passing the word along. But it's just interesting, because I left my former career, because uh -huh. I didn't feel like I was really helping people, and to you know transition to this new world of mine. Yeah. And this is the email that came up. Great. Very good. Awesome, great. Anybody else want to share something? Yes, we want to. Please, please, please. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I, I love love, and I love volume love, and I love loving. And love is just a too obvious of a word, so like the, when it breaks down to it, I, I love penis. And so I did a search. So I did a search for the word penis, and it was, and it went back. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks. Let's hear, let's maybe hear one, one more. I, I found it frustrating because actually like, I, this word is so prevalent that it actually is in every email that I've ever sent by virtue of it being in my, you know, like some, as of two years ago in my signature, and so I couldn't filter it out. Um, so it, it what, like, what was the word? Judaism. Uh -huh. like, I'm a rabbi. It's, it's kind of, you know, so. So I, I yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't really, yeah. Again, again, it's it's a it's a very like imperfect system, but but what it what it starts to generate, or what I think it can start to generate, is again, first of all, that there's there's more in there than we realize. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look for behind you. <laughs> there's more in there. Smiles with your head. Yeah. There's more available to us than we realize. Um, and that actually, for in many cases, searching for that for a word or a string of words or a, a couple of words, you know, you know or a person, um, can can generate some new connections, can generate some new ideas, or can make you think about things in in a, in a new way. So, um, so that's just that's that's a sort of surface look at one part of this kind of work. Now I'd like to I'd like to shift gears into the, the second step here. So once you've found these stories, right? Once you've found a good story, or you found a a, a a a hook or something you want to connect to, how do you tell it? How do you incorporate it into your life? How do you get? How, how do you um, build the art of storytelling and build the art, as as Yvonne put it, of owning your own story? Um, so I'd like you to do one more email search, okay? Uh, and I'd like you to to search for the word of the word of your hometown. 
Okay? The name, the, the name of your hometown, the place where you were born. What I'd like you to do, um, does everybody, I'm curious about something. Does everybody have, is there, is there at least one other person in the room that speaks your native language? Is there, does everybody have one other person in the room that speaks their native language? I don't think I ever. No, that would be unusual. All right, so here's, here's what I, here's what I'd like to propose. Um, find somebody in the room, if possible, that speaks your native language. And what I want you to do is, is, is or, and if not, then not. It, that's not essential. I'm just offering that as an opportunity. Um, uh, what I'd like you to do is share the story of that email. Oh, I, I haven't asked you to choose one. Choose one of those emails, right? Any one of those emails that's good to you, that's, that's going to generate some sparks. It could be an old one. It could be a recent one. Choose one of those emails that, that seems like it has some juice, that seems like it has something that you can work with. Okay? Find someone in the room, not necessarily the person next to you, you can get up and move around, and tell them the story of that email. Now here's, 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 a, here's, a, here's a, uh, a caveat, okay? Tell the stories one at a time. So decide, find a partner, Decide who's going first. That person is going to speak, and your job is to listen, right? And then when they've completed their story, you'll speak. So it's not a conversation. I want one person to tell the story, and the other person to listen. Any questions about that? OK, so there's, there's a small room, and there's a lot of us. So just get up, find some corner of the room if you can, and take about five minutes to share these stories, right? The story of this email. What do you think? Five minutes and then switch? Five minutes total. Great. Go for it. were pretty generative. Um, uh, so I, we're, we're going to stay with these stories for just a little bit longer, so you'll get a, a more chance to explore them. Um, but first of all, just real quickly, would anybody just like to call out something that surprised them in doing this? Just a surprise. Go ahead. I found just one email. One email with your hometown. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Just a quick surprise from doing this exercise. Yes, please. When I looked at my sense folder, it was all me giving directions to people. But when I looked at my inbox, it was all my public library telling me I overdue funds. <laughs> 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 Any other 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 surprises? Great. So what I'd like I, I'd like someone to volunteer, anybody to volunteer, um, and take this place in the hot seat here, and share the story. Share the story of the email, right? But I'd like you to do it without the laptop or iPhone, to do it from mm -hmm. the, way, the way you just told the story, but without the benefit of the email in front of you. Anybody like to volunteer? Please. It's a short story. That, I also, when I searched, only found one email. Great. Put your phone down. You put your phone down. There's nothing to look at. It's just the link. So. Are you worried so, they might read your phone? <laughs> so, and our job out here is simply to listen. OK, so um, uh, I come, well, I was born in a really small town in Russia where my grandparents evacuated to during the war. And um, 
I had nose ear problems as a kid, so I had to have my adenoids removed. And all of that was done without anesthesia when you were growing up in Russia. So um, you were tied to another person, like your grandma, your dad, or whoever took you to the doctor while they operated on you. So needless to say, um, the last name of my doctor, though I don't remember how he looks, really stuck out in my mind. So um, a year ago, I got an email from my dad that said, don't be afraid, semicolon, and the last name of the doctor. And it was his death announcement. <laughs> because the town I come from has you know, very few people who are famous for anything. So <laughs> if somebody dies, like they list those people. So my dad just wanted to know, to let me to know that he's in the grave, so he can no longer. <laughs> 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 So uh, this is great. This is actually a great, it's a great example of this. So actually, I want us out here just to reflect on what just happened, okay? And let's see if we can identify as a group three moments in that story. Do you mind if I leave you there for a moment? No, it's fine. Three moments in that story that made this crowd sit forward or pay attention. Tied to another person. Tied to another person. No, no anesthesia. No anesthesia. Uh, the and the death. <laughs> right? So like, <laughs> at least three, right? Then there, there could be three or four more, yeah, right? Anymore. In that very short story, there were at least three, maybe five, maybe six, maybe seven moments where you felt everybody in the room go lean forward, lean in, <laughs> sit, sit forward, pay attention, gasp, have some kind of audible reaction, right? So as you start, as you um, craft your story, as you think about how you tell a story, those are moments that are key. Those are moments that are important. Moments where in the telling, you feel the audience pay attention, right? So how, what, was the first, how, how was the, what was the first line of the story? What was the introduction to the story? How I ended up in, in this small town, right? Which, and, and then the next thing I think I said was that I had a certain condition that had to be operated on. Right, and then it was after that that you, we got to the part about the, the, the no anesthesia. And what, and what was the very last line of the story? You couldn't hurt her anymore. Yeah. Right. Right. So as you think about as you think about your beginnings of stories and your endings of stories, those are also moments that you can think about bringing your audience in, making your audience sit forward. Um, uh, great. Thank you. Somebody else. Would somebody else like to to uh, have a, have a go in the hot seat? That was a hard story to follow. But anyway, <laughs> go ahead. This is a sad story. So, um, I um, my hometown is Philadelphia, and when I was searching through my emails, one of the things that has continually come up is that. Um, so uh, recently I lost my mother, which has been very, very challenging for me. And so you can kind of see in my email like the indentation of that kind of um, impact of that kind of life event. And um, so when I was searching for my hometown, I found this message from a rabbi in my hometown who had heard that I had lost my mother. And um, he was asking, he was like sending blessings and telling me that he knows what a, what a um, big loss this is. And he said, you know, we're in the local area. Is there anything that we can do for you? And um, and uh, and I was really, really touched by his message. And then what I also found, like sort of attached to that message, was the message that I wrote back to him, saying that it would really mean a lot to me if he and his wife would come to the funeral. And um, they didn't. And they never responded. And um, I actually always wondered what, like, why he never responded? Did I really not send that message? Did it actually send? But it, so I found now it, it did send, and he didn't respond, and so that left me feeling um, kind of sad and alone. You should you should search for hugs again. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of hugs from from that time. That's yeah. true. Thank you for so thank you for sharing that. So let, so let me ask. The, the same question was, what, what was a moment for us in this room that we felt the temperature change, that we felt a, a shift in our, our... He didn't come. 
when, when, we, when we heard that detail, that he didn't respond. This is a sad story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, great. So there's also lots so of, again, there are lots of moments here that change the temperature in the room, that change the way we sit, that change the way we listen. And, and both of our storytellers so far, Oh. Sorry. No, yeah, both of our storytellers so far, you could feel that, right? I mean, you could feel the, 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 the shift in the room, right? It's something that as you're speaking is to be, it's something that as you're speaking and always as you're speaking to be aware of, right? The impact you're having on your audience and if it's something that you want to change or if it's something that you want to craft. You know, Yvonne, ex exactly as, I'm sorry, can you hear me? No, next to you. Anna. Sorry? Anna. Anna, Anna right. As, as, as Anna pointed out, Yvonne set the stage for the story, right? She told us right away that this was a sad story. And we also, like, we also felt that. We felt that in the way she sat down. We felt that in the way she started speaking, right? And in Genya, it was very it was similar in another way. We felt that this was going to be a sort of tongue-in-cheek story. We felt that this was going to have a, a, a there may be a punchline at the end. We could feel that in the way she entered the room, right? So two great, thank you, I mean, two really wonderful, rich examples of different kinds of storytelling and different kinds of impact that they're going to have on us, your audience. Okay, so thank you, Yvonne. You can move out of the hot seat. So, now I'd like you to um, go back to the same group or partner that you were working with before, right? And have a conversation with this group about one way that you could improve the way you tell this story, right? So give one, so think about one pointer that you can give to your partner. Say maybe, using these two examples that we just had, maybe go more into detail about that one event or set the, set the tone more when you, sit, when you first begin. Think about the very last line, think about the very first line. So work a little bit sort of meta storytelling with your group here and craft that story a little bit. Make one improvement or one suggestion into how they're telling this story. But stick with the same story. Don't go into a different story. Does that make sense? <laughs> Giving advice to each other on how they're telling the story. Her story, your story.
Okay, so let's, um, awesome, great. So let's, uh, let's um, come back together. Yes? The hand, does that work? Does that really work? Great, uh, let's come back together. And um, uh, that, awesome, so <coughs> terrific. So share, who would like to share one tip either that they gave or received? One, one, one suggestion that they got from their group about how they're telling this story. Great, please. Um, when I told my story, uh, I didn't really, I kind of was like, this is the this and this is the that. I didn't really give much detail, and she suggested that, uh, like, she got the point of the story, but maybe for more, like, for the listener to relate to it more personally, that I should add in more detail. It doesn't need to be a laundry list. There's just a few specific things that paint the picture a little bit better. Right, and those details, great. And those details help lead you to those sit-forward moments that we all experience. Those moments where your audience really is going to hook onto something, right? Anybody else got a, 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 either something that they re received or something that they gave in terms of a, a suggestion or a detail? Or a suggestion or an improvement? I yes, please. You have to believe that your story is interesting. Great. Great. And what, and what how does that, it helps if you really do believe your story is interesting, but how does that manifest, right? How does that, how do you demonstrate that you believe your story is interesting? Well, no, you're good. I, I found a couple of emails, and I didn't think that, um, none of the stories were interesting enough for me, and then I ended up, like, focusing on one of them and just telling it, and then I felt better about it, like, it was, it was an okay story. <laughs> it was a great story. Can I, can, can I use you as an example for something really quickly? So there's also something that you just demonstrated so beautifully, which is called, which is like a change in body language, right? So when you started telling me like, well, uh, the stories weren't interesting, and I was looking for them, and so I just told one. This is like very like I don't care and you don't care body language, right? <laughs> and then by the end of what you were what you were saying, you were like sitting up and smiling and giving me thumbs up and like actually feeling like I believe that you believe that you felt good about what you were saying. And those kinds of things, I mean this is not an acting class and none of you have to be actors and none of you necessarily are actors, but those kinds of things make an enormous impression on your audience. If you send out a signal with your body or your hands or your voice or your face that you don't care, it doesn't matter if the story is good or not good. I'm not going to care about it, right? But if you um, actually project interest and confidence and, and, and uh, act like you're interested, you could be talking about like the most mindless drivel and people will care. That's what I've been doing for the last hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so it, you, you tell your audience whether or not it's important, right? Great. Anything else? Anything else that came up? Please. Uh, it's not related to a real story. Well, not, not exactly, but uh, this is from the world of theater as well. Uh, you, you gotta have a conflict. It helps a lot if you uh, if you have something as an obstacle or something that go against your will as the hero of the story and describe it. And then there is two two outcomes. Maybe you succeed, maybe you didn't. So it's a, either a sad story or overcoming sort of story. I brought another person. Oh, thanks. Um, so, actually, thank you. And actually, that's a, that's a great point. So when you're, when you're telling a story, think about the obstacle. Think about the thing that you're trying to overcome. And you said sometimes it's a sad story. Sometimes, it's, uh, uh, sometimes you accomplish it. Sometimes you didn't accomplish it. I'd just like to offer that the fact that you're there telling the story is a success. So even if you didn't accomplish the, the little micro thing that you were working on, you're still here because you're still here to tell the story. So it's been broad, broadly, it's a success, right? And that goes back to what Ivan was, was speaking about in terms of owning your story. And part of that means owning the failures as well as owning the successes. The fact that all of you are sitting here or standing somewhere and able to tell a story whether it's a sad story, whether it's a story about loss, whether it's a story about failure, or the opposite of those things, you can, um, you can regard it as a success because you're telling the story, you're owning the story, right? It's actually very powerful to tell a story about something that didn't work 
And we heard some of that in the last couple of days. We've heard people talking about struggles and obstacles and having to change direction and things not working out. And it's actually very, it's very powerful. It's another way to relate to your audience. Yeah, please. I just want to share something that sometimes when I give a lecture and I share either personal stories or general stories, and I see that my audience is not fascinated. It's not fascinated enough. I start making up an ending to make it more. <laughs> <laughs> lying, lying, lying is a really, really great lying. technique. <laughs> I just put more spices on it so that it's more attractive. I, look, never, <laughs> never once in this workshop did I say that these had to be true stories, right? They're stories from the email. We lie in our email all the time, right? So truth Maybe is like. Too. Maybe I do, so don't, don't trust anything I do. No, truth is totally optional and subjective. We're not talking about truth anyway. Um, okay, great, so we only have about uh, four or five minutes left. Um, I, I just wanna sort of close the loop by saying that the last step, which we didn't really get to today, but the last step is bridging, the, bridging those, two, those two kinds of ideas. Bridging ways we talk about our work with stories from our life, finding tips or tools or techniques to create those sit forward moments in our audience, working on our stories as, as like pieces of literature, as pieces of text, thinking about them having conflict, thinking about them having a beginning, an ending, thinking about details that you want to add. Really think about it as, a, as, a, as you would a paper that you're writing, as you would a story you're writing for the newspaper. And, it, and you start to create a sense of ownership around it. You start to create a sense that, that it's your story, it's only your story, and only you can make someone else care about this story. And when you draw the, the line from that to your passion, your work, your art, your project, your issue, your cause, you start to create something really powerful. You start to create a really um, uh, crucial, and I think un uh, um, uh, mo probably the most crucial thing you can do, which is really connect to the person you're speaking to. And the last thing is that I, I encourage you to think about this as a tool to use anywhere in your life. All of the context where you might be on a stage, a staff meeting, uh, an interview, um, a performance, giving a lecture, whatever it is, we all have a moment somewhere in our life that the focus is on you. And these tools are, are valuable um, in, in helping make the most out of those moments, making an impact when you have the spotlight when you have the focus, when you have people looking at you. Um, so I, I guess there's probably a couple of minutes if you have any questions or anything that I didn't explain well. Um, I, what, sorry? About three minutes. About three minutes, great. So please. Have you done this workshop before? Never. You're really good at it. Thank you. <laughs> really good at it. Thanks. How do you use this as an artist? Do you just sit down and say, okay, I'm gonna search for words until you find something good? Do you discipline yourself? Kind of, yeah. So I, I so the, like the last piece I did, and I'll just sit, speak for less than 45 seconds about it, I, I took a historical figure um, whose letters had recently been published, and that's what sort of got me thinking about the fact that I don't have letters that can someday be published for the David Chapman Museum. Um, so <laughs> like, I started thinking, like, well, if I wanted to look at my upbringing versus his upbringing, how would I do that? So I took his letters, and I like... I did sort of similar work on myself, and, I, and that, that just gave me an, a, some ideas about how to use this as a methodology. And I created a piece that was about like me at nine years old and this historical figure at nine years old and did a sort of side-by-side -side comparison. That's a That's short version. Yes? So this is the, since then you're working with storytelling, or is it a longer story of a storytelling <laughs> working? Yeah, I, I didn't, telling your story was something that, like, I don't think of myself as a professor. Someone said, oh, you're doing the professional storytelling workshop. It's not actually something that I identify myself as. I wanted to do a workshop on found text, and they're like, great, telling your story with found text. So, um, ROI loves the stories I'm learning. So, I, this is, I'm, yes, yes it is. I own it. Uh, please. Do you write? I write, you mean e besides emails? Yeah, or hi I do write like handwritten letters, but um, I recognize that it's like a sort of idiosyncratic thing to do. Mm -hmm. write you a letter. I will write you a letter. <laughs> so thank you, thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you for sharing this with each other too.